This is Mike Goldberg, the voice of Bellator MMA. Great to be podside once again. Set to enter the podcast right now. Our tale of the tape, the current undefeated champion of the world, Captain Hooter, defending his title once again. And I can tell you, no champion has ever defended his podcast this many times. Well, since podcast began. Can he do it again? Let's find out. Here we go! It's Captain Hooter. Hello. Dzień dobry. Bon dia. Dobre utra. Dobre utra. It is our third Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We look up acting. Buenos dias. Hello. Everybody online looking good. Morning. Sawadee so krab. Good night. Dobroho ranku. Bon dia. Como va? Habari a tu buhi. Good morning world. What's happening, everyone? Hooter here, coming to you high and alive and tripping. How about this for a virtual 3D environment? Oh, yeah, baby, that's what I'm talking about. We be tripping hard. And this is a perfect, perfect perfect environment for today's very special interview wow look at this place so we have a very special interview today with the head of the hate street shroom shop i'm talking about michael james wow Maiko James from the Hate Street Shroom Shop. Whoa. Dude, we're going to have a chat with him, and we're going to learn all about what's going on in San Francisco and about the legalities of psilocybin and other psychedelics in California. I thought it was already legal there, didn't you? Dude. Anyway, this is going to be a fantastic interview. Watch this interview with James, and I'll be back in a few minutes. Hola, hola, everyone. Captain Hooter here, once again, very high and very alive. And today we're on different dimensions, and I have a very, very special guest today, uh, Maiko James. Maiko James hey. from the Hade Street uh, Shroom Shop in San Francisco, California. Dude, thank you so oh. much for coming. What's up, Captain? How you doing, man? Dude, I'm uh, in love with you. Thanks for pulling us together. Yeah, <laughs> I know it's dude. late your time. No, 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 but dude, any time for you, absolutely. I, I am, I'm in love with you, dude. I've been uh, uh, such a huge fan of your Instagram page and your website. And when I heard about your story and how you got started and how you were involved in not just, you know, like the normal mushroom kind of situation, you're actually there and fighting the power. And the powers that be. And that's a, a whole nother thing. Can you catch us up a little bit about where you are right now? Sure, sure. So, um, uh, well, thank you, first and foremost. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with uh, the captain of cannabis himself. Uh, I appreciate you and all your work and, and all the amazing things that you're doing, spreading the love of one of my favorite plant medicines, mm -hmm. period, in the world. Uh, part of the reason that I even live in this beautiful uh, city of San Francisco is because I have uh, a, a great relationship with cannabis and and that was kind of a starting point for bringing me out here but now here i am kind of like uh being a different type of advocate uh towards the ideas of um, creating uh equity and inclusion uh for um, natural entheogenic plant medicines and even further than that like discussions revolving around psychedelics and the different types of applications that can occur for um, different communities and uh you know, SF is kind of like, uh, you know, Hippie Hill is literally like two blocks away from where I'm sitting right now. Mm. And for those of you out there know that 
um, with, uh, with understanding the idea of entheogens being ancient technology uh, <clears throat> as a starting point for the kind of counterculture movement and resurgence of the idea of bringing um, entheogens, plant medicines uh, into the world as well as psychedelics uh, started right here just a couple blocks from where I'm sitting and it's been uh, discussion points I've been working on here for over three years uh, within my beautiful, beautiful place. <laughs> it, is one of, it is one of the most fantastic areas and neighborhoods in California. Uh, I was very lucky to uh, be up there for about six months, seven months. And uh, every opportunity that I had, I made it over to the Hay. And just the vibe of the feel, the people, the shops, the stores, the clubs, the restaurants, everything there is my vibe. I love that whole area. And the fact that you're there now is just, you know, spectacular. Now, can you tell me a little bit, though, about Decrim San Francisco? Sure. Okay. Sure. So Decrim SF, Decriminalized Nature San Francisco, is, um, you know, a local uh, nonprofit um, organization that's been here um, in the city since 2018 uh, when uh, Decriminalized Nature Oakland passed their legislation uh, to decriminalize entheogenic plant medicine uh, for the people. And uh, what happened after that amazing event was, um, you know, I advocated to bring, uh, you know, the leaders and that entire organization over here to San Francisco to initiate the conversations with our board of supervisors. And, you know, in a lot of these, uh, when you start talking about local discussions, whether it's a council or a board mm. of supervisors, or, you know, they even have senator type of or assembly members, whatever, whatever those conversations are. Uh, I've been working here locally to just make sure that all the politicians have an understanding of um, what, you know, entheogenic plant medicine, fungi, and particularly to me as, as a mushroom guy and just a mycologist that really loves uh, teaching people about cultivation, uh, what it means for our communities to uh, be able to open these conversations and then eventually move towards like regulatory frameworks and like inclusive regulatory frameworks and equitability because you know san francisco has this amazing history with prop 215 which was the compassionate care act revolving around cannabis which was the starting point of everything for yeah. for like you know people like you and, and me to just advocate for cannabis as a as a medicine and as a recreational you know um substance and, and plant for people to like learn and love and, and live with uh, breaking down those barriers um, is is part of what the history of San Francisco is, you know, with Dennis Perone and him bringing proposition uh, proposition I and then J, which brought Prop 215 to the greater state of California, uh, decriminalizing the plant medicine, protecting the patients, protecting the doctors, and creating um, cooperative systems initially uh, to be able to allow people to um, engage with the consumption, and especially people. Uh, like patients that were in end of life care, cancer patients, and so many uh, different individuals that have been able to benefit from these plants. Right. And so that's the next step is like having that conversation around entheogens, fungi, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and making sure that we have a voice here in San Francisco. You know, it's funny because I talked to a couple of people the other day and we were talking about mushrooms. And I was under, for some reason, I, I was thinking that mushrooms are already legal. <laughs> That is a great that is a great discussion point, right? Le legality and and decriminalization are kind of two different separate points of conversation when we get into what like markets, facilitators, community groups, um, ceremonies, all these different things that revolve around entheogens, plant medicines, fungi, psychedelics. Like, what are the what are the modalities that are people are going to be access to? And and we so the first step. In, in really discussing all of this is just decriminalizing people's personal consumption and possession. And that's what decriminalization is. So you have all these amazing, amazing locales, you know, really like close to here, Oakland, Santa Cruz, um, and then across the great uh, nation, you know, like Oregon already has like a whole psilocybin like uh, initiative with um, measure 109 that has basically created this like structure for people to start like creating psilocybin medicine and facilitate and what is the licensure and things like that. And, and that's a great starting point, you know? And I think uh, California is really interesting because, you know, in our past, we always led with legislation, but when we get into nationwide discussions that are progressive and things like that, California will let other places like Colorado or like Oregon go first, even Washington and all these other places and mm -hmm. give them a framework to actually try and develop it 
However, here's the big, here's the big however, man. It's just like, you know, capitalization, corporatization, and, um, you know, what I like to call pay to play models, like in cannabis, especially here in California with Prop 64, which most of us that are in the mid scale um, understanding in cottage industries, like we know that that, that particular piece of legislation does not really progress um, giving medicine, providing an, an equitable structure for profit sharing. Right. in the state it's, and it sucks so it's you know it's strange because uh i i know that the last time that i was in california i saw three or four different very professional looking products that were microdose uh magic mushroom it, hey if you're over in oakland there are you know cultivators practitioners you know alchemists herbalists all creating medicine for the people and, and when we look at where cannabis was back in, you know, the early 90s and into the, you know, early 2000s, it, it was this progressive state to where we are now with the level of cannabis that we consume, right? And like, whether, you know, you're an individual that smokes flour, you know, smokes joints, smokes blunts, um, smokes bowls, smokes bongs, you know, takes dabs, like just from the inhalation, just from like that particular like methodology is so advanced from where it was, you know, 45 years ago when everybody was just smoking a J on the corner, you know, and freaking Full of you know, seeds and stems. Claire was getting arrested for smoking two joints <laughs> and going to jail. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're so far from that shit, you know, Big Chief is still out there in Ann Arbor, like holding it down. And and people don't even know that Ann Arbor was like decriminalized with cannabis for like years and years and years, you know, and, and, and it's trying to connect all these conversations and, uh, and be a, a lighthouse. That's what my space here is, is just an educational space to yeah. work with people in small groups and one on one helping them build their knowledge out on this. Right. So your facility is is in a by appointment only scenario. Can you can you talk a little bit about how this journey started for you? Sure. You know, um, it's it's interesting because, you know, um, talking about entheogens and plant medicines and psychedelics wasn't really the starting point for me with fungi. Um, it, it kind of all started when my wife um, was diagnosed uh, with breast cancer right. and just being here in SF and trying to be healthy individuals and people that like engage with our greater, um, you know, community and nature and just getting outside, you know, like the, one of the things I love about California, it's like, you know, snow, sand, sea, you know, like you can move through like any type of environment that you're interested in. And it's always drawn me to this, uh, this place. Um, but when we were going through trying to figure out the type of, um, you know, protocol to create, a really good friend of mine introduced me to um, the work of Paul Stamets mm -hmm. and um, the his like TED talk from, I think it was like uh, 2012, maybe even earlier than that. But he, um, he talks about the use of turkey tail mushroom um, as an immune system booster in conjunction with Western therapies using um, drugs like Herceptin um, and chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And my wife's prognosis was the same the exact same, her two positive, um, triple, uh, triple A positive um, breast cancer stage two and Paul Stamets's mother was the same at stage four. And in that, in the conclusion of that amazing, you know, piece of, um, of kind of revelation in, in what he does in that TED talk, he brings his mom up this on the stage and she's in full remission mm -hmm. um, from basically, you know, a, you know, um, a death sentence from cancer when you're in stage four. So, Undertook that, purchased um, uh, Paul's uh, amazing fungi perfecti supplements for over a year while Melinda went through her um, uh, through her treatment. Can and I stop you right there? Can I stop you right there? Ahead. Can you talk to me more about those, what you're talking about, the treatments, his treatments? Sure, sure. So, um, uh, you know, when you go, depending on the type of cancer you have, you know, they, they'll, they're going to give you a prognosis. They're going to like, check into your lymph nodes. They're going to um, look at um, the level of aggression that's there and what type of, um, you know, Western uh, medicine with, you know, radiation and chemotherapy can, can be the most active uh, path towards remission, right. right? Once you have cancer, cancer isn't always, it's not always gone. The potential for it to remain because of the way hormones and things work in the body 
um, and the way systems um, are driven, uh, there's potential for it to recur, right? And so, you know, once you go, once you know that you're diagnosed and you go through the Western treatment, you know, like there's a lot of things that are associated with um, just the side effects of those very um, aggressive drugs on the human body. And so as you're working on attacking the cancer and working on, um, you know, rem you know, putting your immune system into um, sort of a remissive state so you can really focus on um, the, the negative things that are going on in the body, uh, you can um, hopefully uh, put it into a state where it completely kills it or, or takes it out. And it depends on the type of cancer, right? There, uh, one of the things that's really difficult in the space of like helping people was there's so many different types of cancer and there's, again, so many different types of mushrooms. Mm. And so finding that recipe for, for anybody, you know, like is part of, um, part of the process because you need to know what types of mushrooms you should be consuming or shouldn't be consuming. Just like when we forage mushrooms in the wild, mm -hmm. you don't just eat any mushroom you find because you think it's a psilocybin mm -hmm. mushroom. Mm -hmm. A proper mycologist will like really make sure that it is. And if it is, then the beauty of finding mushrooms in the wild is once you know that spot, they will return. Right. And, and you know, so working with the turkey tail mushroom, which is an amazing immune system booster, um, was an amazing uh, protocol in conjunction with that radiation um, and uh, chemotherapy and then the West and then the really deeper um, cancer drugs that um, Melinda consumed for over a year. So, is, is the turkey tail mushroom the most used medicinal mushroom? Actually, no, it isn't. I would say um, there might be like a battle between the top three from medicinal aspects for the polysac um, polysaccharides and beta glucans, which are kind of the the higher level compounds and sterols that we're looking at into mushrooms that are now being broken down, just in the same way that like cannabis was broken down. That now we're really there's so much more research going into like you know fungi and like their overall um, properties. And so when we talk about different like classes of mushrooms, we have like basically an ecology for the mushrooms that humans consume. We have three different classes. We have mycorrhizal mushrooms, parasitic mushrooms, and saprotrophic mushrooms. 90% of the mushrooms that we consume as humans are in that saprophyte, sapro, uh, saprotrophic like class. Like for instance, reishi is probably the most medicinally consumed mushroom because in um, you know, uh, Eastern culture, they have been consumed for thousands of years. And there's a ton of a ton of research that has gone into that particular mushroom for its anti-tumor, anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory, and kind of like what I like to call chi and system flow mm. um, attributes. Now, while well, turkey tail in the more westernized um, kind of model has been used as an immune system like um, functional mushroom to help boost the immune system. Now you need to be conscious of that. If you have an autoimmune disease, you don't want to eat an immune system system boosting mushroom right. right so that's why like working with your doctors being conscious of the type of things that you're consuming and how they affect the human body are really important and then bringing context to your personal health and making sure that you're you know you as anybody or anyone out there not you in particular but mm -hmm. we're all anecdotally our own citizen scientists because what we consume on a daily basis affects the way our system runs what we do with our body and our mind and then in our spiritual sense, like what we do on those things on a consistent basis are what allow balance. Yeah. And so that's what mushroom consumption is to me, whether you're taking gourmet mushrooms that taste good, that have amazing amounts of like great vitamins and protein and things available to you, or you're taking medicinal mushrooms that work on your body system and function and your brain function, or you're taking neurotropic and therapeutic mushrooms like lion's mane, so psilocybin mushrooms, that are kind of like really trying to rebuild those connections because we all whack our noodle around. We all have moments of up and down as we ride those waves of life. Mm -hmm. And and there's natural medicine that's available to all of us. Sure, sure. Now from a, a more, let's go into into the fun side, the recreational side a little bit. Uh, you're you're sure. in the home of, of where, you know, acid really the deal, uh, liquid acid, tab acid, Mm -hmm. uh, in in the beginning of the life. Owsley, uh, the Owsley Stanley world, the bear, he's yeah. the he's the man. Yeah. Un unbelievable. And while while I was there, I couldn't believe how much of it was there. Um, and 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 it was a mecca at one point. Yeah. And and let's and let's acknowledge 
how, you know, LSD uh, came into the world here and how it became, you know, a cultural movement, because, you know, whether you're talking about, you know, um, um, the fathers of, of LSD production here, Owsley, Stanley, you know, Bear, the guy that brought it to the Grateful Dead and brought it to the street corners and brought it to the people here at, on mass, or you're talking about um, uh, Nick Scully um, and, um, uh, oh man, I'm, I'm forgetting his name, um, but the the whole crew that was really mass producing Orange Sunshine and the Brotherhood of Eternal Love and the people that were like really mass distributing it to the people trying to make a cultural um, and perceptual shifts. Orange Sunshine. Um, okay, so just had Jair from from Amsterdam, who has a cannabis museum, and he has one of the us? he has one of the surfboards from the Orange Sunshine movie that was funded partially from smuggling, and inside the surfboard is a stash spot. Uh, that was, LSD, oh, yeah. It was a, just they were a, they were they were progressive. Creative. They managed to they managed to turn on the world. I mean, if you if you read any of uh, Terrence's uh, like true hallucinations, right? He talks about in that particular um, like recount how when he's in I think Nepal, where he like his brother sends him like a tab of, like a couple tabs of orange or pills because it was mainly pressing pills at that time mm -hmm. of orange sunshine he just like talks about melting into the universe there uh while also smoking some sort of natural dmt at the same time which is like mind-numbing in of itself <laughs> thinking about you know um all that progressive like uh you know movement towards western um, consumption of all these different plants, antigens, and, and compounds. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you started into DMT, and I, I guess right now the, the real uh, fads of the moment are really uh, DMT and ayahuasca. Um, and you know, probably there's, there's, I would imagine that there's going to ultimately become some sort of micro dosing formats of those. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt. I think. So I think all entheogens come in, in, you know, in so many levels. So let's just uh, acknowledge the differences, right? Like entheogens, uh, fun, entheogenic fungi, entheogenic plant medicine are kind of the ones that naturally have these different tryptamines and phenethylamines that create psychedelic states, okay? Mm -hmm. And they come in many different flavors um, and they can be combined together with MAOIs or other things to extend the experience. But if we're just going to kind of like talk about like ayahuasca and dmt right dmt comes from a lot of natural plants right and the mosa uh, hostilis and the acacia plant like there's a lot of different places that like high levels of dmt can be extracted and then you know that can be consumed in many different formats right mm -hmm. and then ayahuasca is a natural through the chakruna and other types of um, the copy vine like in other types of MAOIs that exist down in South America, they can take these two vines, combine them together in a brew, which creates a, um, a long staying psychedelic effect and makes the body and the breaking of the blood brain barrier much more like easy. But you have to, to say, throw it, up and poop all over. Yeah, the I was about to you? say, not that the experience is easy because, <laughs> well, you know, and that's one of the things that I've heard like the whole idea of purging, you know, even with entheogenic mushrooms, like with, uh, with um, psychedelic fungi, yeah. Uh, it's still not necessarily an easy experience on the stomach. And that's why one of the progressive things that's going to happen with the way the consumption starts is people are going to start doing these different methodologies and creating all these different levels for the consumption of psilocybin, right? And the thing that's really important revolving around decriminalization and legalization is that we need to create space for those types of like, what I like to call like research settings, ceremonial settings, and then eventually we're going to get to recreational settings right. and how we distribute recreational things, whether it's in a microdosing format or it's if you go to a doctor and you get a license or you go to a, a practitioner or some sort or you're being part of a church, there's a way that you can consume more ceremonial level things. And the things that are important about that is the harm reduction that exists around that. Sure. Because in the end, we, we can't have, you know, like 18 year old kids and 21 year old kids that aren't educated in antigens to just go to the dispensary and get five gram chocolate bars and go to outside lands without some sort of knowledge what they're getting themselves into. Right. And, and the reality is if we create good systems, we'll then be able to allow people to go out into recreational settings and absolutely have all the, all the support systems around that to allow them to enjoy mm -hmm. these, like the music and the 
art and all the amazing things that can come to light from the creative aspects of the vintage and psychedelics. And now that nobody's playing golf, what a great uh, uh, way to re, uh, redesign all those golf courses. Uh, magic oh, hey, I'm, I'm going to manifest it. I'm going to manifest it. This it year goes. is the 55th anniversary of the human being, and I want Golden Gate Park to have an amazing event again uh, in, in that space. So uh, everybody come to Golden Gate Park. Find Oh, the mushroom. I found that for you. I found that for you. I, I have saved this for when you were here. This is the new mushroom pipe. I like yours oh, better than amazing. mine. <laughs> <laughs> Want to trade? Oh, man. I'll trade you. <laughs> yeah. Spark it up, my man. Spark it up. I appreciate you. Oh, dude. Oh, dude. So tell me, what, what is it like right now? I mean, the, the scenario, the, the atmosphere um, in California, 2022, you're halfway through the year. You've got uh, potential of some uh, finally having some sort. I mean, everything's legal, but black market still dominates everything mm -hmm. there. Um, uh, what do you think's going to happen? That um, you know, putting <laughs> uh, sitting down and kind of taking you know that mushroom crystal ball and just kind of like manifesting like what it is that the future could bring. You know, um, first and foremost, there's a lot of conversations to be continued. There's a lot of conversations to be had. There's so many different groups that need a seat at the table because entheogens and, you know, um, like plant medicines and entheogenic fungi like psilocybin are just stepping stones and, and just this ancient technology that really we need to bring back to the people first. Isn't it legal right now in Canada? Completely legal? Um, so it's it's decriminalized in Canada. Okay. However, because of their law structure, um, you can go, I know for certain right now, I have friends that live up in Vancouver telling me that there's like 12 plus dispensaries that are already selling. Just like Amsterdam used to do, you know, back in the early and mid 2000s before mm -hmm. uh, they uh, create they stopped allowing that and then you know that loophole that still exists for the the uh, psilocybin containing um, truffles um sclerotia uh mm -hmm. it still exists there so there's you know and that's funny because what that does is it really confines the the varietals that they can make available there's only like you know four to six psilocybin containing varietals that grow sclerotia mm -hmm. so they're very confined to what the experiences are because when we start getting down to it and discussing varietals of, of psilocybin containing mushrooms, the psilocybe um, cubensis spe specifically, that genus specifically, mm -hmm. there's over 116 known varietals that are mm -hmm. psilocybin containing mushrooms that okay. are under that category. So really there's like so much more work to be done to kind of figure out where the different applications of just fungi are, right? right. And right. so when we come back and we start talking about more of the, the deeper entheogens like ayahuasca, like wachuma, like um, peyote, like um, ibogaine, and kind of like, you know, bufa alvarius, 5-MeO-DMT uh, in a natural form versus a synthetic form, and all these really big discussions that need to happen are sort of, are, are kind of like the launch points to try and figure out where the future is going to be. Because in the end, if we sit back and we let, um, you know, political and corporate interests take control of the overall discussion. And that doesn't mean they're not going to be there. You know, like I have to be very honest. I, I live here in San Francisco and as much as SF is known for its progressive like politics, like I have literally waited three years to be able to, as I, as I'm about to say right now, is like bring it to my board of supervisors. So this coming Tuesday, I'm going to be discussing with my board supervisors, you know, the decriminalization of entheogen, um, entheogens and um, entheogenic fungi here in San Francisco. That's fantastic, dude. You're taking another step forward. Is it, that's the thing that's so, it's like you, you, you started on your, on your path and on your mission and it's like, you've just picked up some uh, speed as you've rolled along and uh, you know, you're going into the full fight the power mode now. I've had yeah. interviews, I've had interviews with uh, uh, Dana Larson who's up in Vancouver, who's kind of in the I same- I know Dana really well. So he's he's got a, uh, uh, his place that he has in Vancouver now is uh, they're selling coca, uh, uh, coca tea. Wow. Uh, you can buy coca plants. And uh, he's, he's, he's just been bending every 
every little law that he can possibly do. And uh, he also got himself put on the banned list. He can't go to Russia now. Uh, so... <laughs> Oh darn! I know, I know. <laughs> like, I really want to go to Russia right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, uh, and no, no disrespect to Russia at all. The people there actually have an amazing kind of history with entheogenic fungi, like the Amanita muscaria. Like Siberia is where the Siberian shamans are really who like manifested the great medicines that can be developed through um, consuming the Amanita muscaria mushroom, which is the same mushroom in my logo here. Um, so. And yeah, please go ahead and ask. It's always a fun, co- it's a fun conversation. <laughs> in Siberia, you gotta go to Siberia. To be so, to so there's a there's a folklore there's a folklore legend about this. Okay, so there's an idea that the Siberian shamans were the keepers of these plant medicines, and they used to ride reindeers around in sleighs. And in the deeper months, when there's no food or anything like that, what they would do is they would bring around this brew. Um, and what they wore is they wore big like coats, fur coats. And this is supposedly where the idea of Santa Claus comes Santa from. Santa Claus, sure. Yeah, that's why there's a direct relationship in a lot of like folk imagery of Santa Claus with mushrooms. The red and white. <laughs> and he also takes his reindeer in flight. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so uh, just to be candid and kind of like not <laughs> a little graphic. Um, the, there's an idea that um, basically uh, the shaman that was carrying around this, this medicine was basically what he was doing is he had collected all the Amanitas right on the front end of the winter and then he stored them and then he would feed them to the reindeer. When the reindeer ate them, what would end up happening is as it processes through their liver, what ends up coming out is really the active compounds that are really want to be consumed. So basically he would collect the reindeer urine and then he would make a brew out of that. And then that is the brew that he would share with everybody <laughs> as he goes out. Yeah, it's um, so let's be <laughs> honest, you know, like Amanita muscaria is a, is a um, it's not a uh, it's not a tryptamine con- uh, containing um, uh, mushroom. It's actually more of a, like a, a psychoactive sedative, like similar to ketamine uh, with uh, muscarium and the muscaria uh, compounds that are in it. So. Can when people cross, who don't when, live, when people don't people who don't live in Russia or Siberia can they ever get that? So that that's a funny question. You know, depending on where you are internationally, there are like if you can get Siberia and Amanita muscaria, then just because of being able to get that varietal, right? There you can you can very much kind of hold to the fact that that might be something you could, could create a brew out of, right? I I want to be like one hundred percent transparent here. Like let's just mm-hmm. make sure like this oh. isn't. Like, an experience for the faint of heart it's not mm-hmm. like it's not necessarily fun per mm-hmm. se but it's kind of like perceptive and it's more like a instead of like going up here you're more like going down yeah. here, you okay. know, like really rooting down into the earth and the in the mycorrhizal relationship that Amanita muscaria has with the plants and trees that it grows around you know, so, it's interesting that you talked about doing that in the, in, in, in that kind of a, a, a method something i saw while i was in jamaica was a uh, shroom shine where they take uh, uh, the, uh, I think they, these were golden teachers, uh, chopped up inside the little 400 milliliter of overproof white rum. Uh, oh, and yeah. Then, yeah. And then, and then they had something that they could actually dose. Oh, yeah. So, um, so fresh mushrooms, right? This is an interesting thing. It's like the reason that um, there's a discomfort associated with consuming mushrooms is 90% of people consume dried mushrooms, right? A dried mushroom that is, is, you know, mushrooms in their life, right, which is a very short time period of, you know, span. And the, as soon as the, you know, the veil uh, is broken and the cap and the gills are exposed, this mushroom is at the death. It's at the end of its life cycle because it's spreading its spores out into the world so that its genetic information can continue on to find new food sources. So, you know, when we start talking about fresh mushrooms versus dried mushrooms, dried mushrooms are the way that we preserve those compounds after we take all the water out. So what's left behind is called chitin in, or chitin or chitin, it depends on where you are in the world, mm-hmm. but C-H-I-T-I-N, that chitin is a, um, a biomass, a cell wall structure that our body isn't necessarily attuned to break down. That's why when you're consuming fresh mushrooms, you always cook your mushrooms, you don't eat raw mushrooms. It's been a misconception, right? We only used to eat the cob salads that we get at the, the cafeteria with all the button mushrooms chopped up on top of it. Well, that isn't really offering the full like benefit, which is very minimal with white button mm-hmm. mushrooms or cremini mushrooms in comparison to like a 
consuming fresh oyster mushrooms or like fresh shiitake mushrooms or something like that. <laughs> it is. You could get me spitting on fungi all day. I but. know. And, but and see, I love this. I mean, this is, I, I've been, I've been really, 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 I've learned so much in the last real 10 years. And, uh, you know, when I was in Jamaica, I learned a tremendous amount from the Rastafarians, uh, uh, from my friend First Man. I want to reiterate too. So like what you're talking about too, that fresh mushroom experience. Oh, right. Mushrooms are 90% water. Right. So if you put it, if, if you pick it fresh before the veil is fully broken and you've got a very fresh mushroom, you can preserve that mushroom. A lot of the ancient kind of methodologies like use preservation like honey and chocolate as a part of the Mazatex, like used to use these as part of their ceremony and their rituals. Mm -hmm. Right. And when you consume things like chocolate with with psilocybin containing mushrooms, that's an MAOI in of itself. Right. And if you add sugar into it and you add citrus into it, you add these different kind of things, you're going to change the level of experience that exists. Mm -hmm. And so when you put it in alcohol, when it's still a lot of water, what does it do? It just pulls all the water right out of it immediately. And so then you can really kind of get like, here, you take this many drams and that takes you here very easy, especially with that damn fine high proof to make mama. Yes. Yes, I. <laughs> Yes, I. I'll tell you what. There, that there, stuff is so good. <laughs> you know, and, and and if you go to almost any uh, Jamaican grandmother's uh, kitchen up in the corner, you'll find a big bottle of rum with a, a, a some a, a split, not some yeah, herbs, a spear, some, some herbs, sea moss, it, right? some yeah. some many different things. Yeah, yeah, it's uh that's how they make the good medicine, and uh, and those those traditional folk technologies are like still so amazing and prevalent when it comes to creating your own medicine, right? Whether you're making like turkey tail tinctures, reishi tinctures, you're like, I love like mixing CBD. Like I get amazing California sun grown organic CBD. And then I, I mix it with a lot of my mushrooms because to me, like creating that like anti-inflammatory and like beta glucan polysaccharide mix, whether it's lion's mane, turkey tail reishi, it's just these are the types of medicines that kind of like should be like shared out to the world. And um, how are you exactly mixing that? Oh, I do it exactly like you're saying, man. I put it into 90 proof alcohol. I get okay. really good organic vodka mm -hmm. um, because it's easily accessible. You can do it with Everclear, right? Like I get asked that a lot. Like, should oh, should I? Can I use you know like you know Everclear or you know grain alcohol? Yeah, you can. Of course, you're gonna get a good extraction from it. Well, holy shit does that stuff burn man mm. like i'd rather have like 90 proof like good organic um vodka or something that's a little bit more consumable and then allow the plant matter and the fungi material to sit in it over time and you end up getting as long as you know you agitate it here and there you're going to get a really great extraction and and i found that you know letting it sit for a certain amount of time creates very consistent results i've had it tested and you know have all the numbers that i need if I wanted to ever like, you know, make a whole bunch of it, but this methodology is easy and then you just can do it in like port jars. And, and that to me is the way people should make their own medicine. You know, I, I, I if I recall correctly, you were also doing some uh, very cool work with, uh, with a, a disabled and or um, uh, challenged veterans. Um, yeah. Um, thanks for bringing that up. And as uh, I just want to just acknowledge, you know, um, you know, amazing people like yourself that like, you know, do service for the country in a lot of different ways. Um, it's, it's such a big organization. Like people don't, you know, usually the exposure to people that aren't in the military structure, you know, only see like one or two, but it's so immense. And there's so many people coming out from so many different walks of life. Um, that one of the things that I do here as uh, my volunteer work is I work with a nonprofit out of the Legion of Honor called um, One Vet, One Voice. And their mission statement is bringing um, housing, uh, job opportunity, training, and um, finding uh, mental health um, applications for veterans here in San Francisco. And so I work as a volunteer educator kind of talking about these alternative healing modalities because there's a lot of veteran voices right now that are out there um, in the psychedelic and entheogenic plant medicine space. Um, and the application of um, using these, uh, these different substances uh, for veterans that are coming back from a, a whole bunch of different traumas and a whole bunch of different, you know, mental health issues and physical issues. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's so immense right now. So 
you know, like trying to be um, an educational resource is one of the things that I do here. And, and um, I volunteer my time locally and I'm trying to help uh, uh, with a, vo a veteran steering committee here to create um, uh, the Veterans uh, Psychedelic Conference uh, oh, this coming awesome. March in uh, 2023. Oh, that's excellent. You know, I've, I've been hearing also about uh, 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 psychedelics and different types of psychedelics being used for end of life treatments. Uh, yeah. Palliative care, right? That's, that's an important one. Uh, um, there's a lot of um, application for that, right? And so the John Hopkins, um, you know, uh, study that was going back on 2014, 2015 was initially working with end of life care patients. And, and that was one of the first studies that, that brought a lot of efficacy to the psilocybin in end of life care. Um, I, uh, you know, I work with a lot of different um, practitioners here locally and try and support them as, a, as an educator and as a, um, uh, you know, supporter uh, for them in, in educating them in this space. And, and you know, and it's, uh, you know, it's a fine line, right? Because as we, as we open up the discussions from a legislative standpoint here in San Francisco, you know, we have a lot of really big organizations that are here already from an academic standpoint, right? We have right. UCSF and then there's the um, like privately funded Neuroscape uh, Institute that is in conjunction with UCSF where Robert Carhart Harris is. And we also have CIIS, right? The Center for Inter um, Integral and Integrative Studies, which has the only accredited um, psychedelic, uh, um, uh, licensed psychedelic uh, therapy program in the country. So, you know, our discussions here in SF are, are progressive and different than a lot of other communities and locales because we already have this weird infrastructure that's here where people are doing research. However, there's like no public access at all. And yeah. so, you know, when we look at amazing places like Oakland and Santa Cruz that have created public access by by decriminalizing the personal possession and consumption of entheogenic plants and fungi, then, you know, like we look at their discussions and recognize that San Francisco has a different set of like um, needs as a greater community because of like organizations like that and because of the potential money that's going to come into this. Now, yeah. what are you allowed to do? What are they? Well, what? I'm a, I'm allowed to talk about psilocybin. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is a free country, man. I'm allowed to talk about psychedelics. Yeah. Um, uh, just be, you know, from a very uh, from a very candid standpoint. You know, what I want to do, what I want to do is I want to teach people how to grow whatever type of mushrooms that they want to grow. Right now, I teach people how to grow gourmet medicinal mushrooms, and I talk about therapeutic neurotropic mushrooms like lion's mane psilocybin. Right. Um, but, but full big caveat, just because, um, psilocybin pretending mushrooms are on the schedule one, um, you know, classification, uh, it is illegal to, um, uh, consume, um, cultivate and, um, you know, even, uh, share the intent of, of teaching people how to cultivate. Yeah, so part of my, my, my charge here, part of my journey here is to get to the point where I can legally have those discussions. So when people have questions to me. It's just a simple answer because the best part about growing mushrooms is a lot of mushrooms grow very much the same. Mm -hmm. And so once you understand the process of how mushrooms are cultivated and how mushrooms grow in the wild, the process of growing whatever mushrooms you want is pretty straightforward. I love watching and been watching your reels and your clips when you've been out foraging uh, 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 in the in the wild hills of San Francisco, but you do. That, have that's my thoughts. favorite thing to do. Yeah, it's it's my favorite thing to do. You know, I'm I'm really blessed, and that's the thing too is like you know, SF's a big microclimate place, right? And our mushroom season is not right now. Everywhere else in the greater United States is like mushroom to heaven, <laughs> right? It's it's summertime. You have high humidity. You have moisture. You have rainstorms, and that's when mushrooms want. Here in Northern California that happens in our winter. And so, you know, as October rolls in through about, you know, March, you know, April, May, maybe June, you know, it depends on how much snow we get over the Sierras. I, I follow the snow line as much as I can to try and continue foraging for mushrooms. That's cool. You know, uh, m one of my mentors, my, uh, my Obi-Wan Kenobi, uh, Max Montrose, uh, the founder of the uh, Tricom Institute uh, moved this year, last year, last year to Oregon. 
and he is uh, doing all types of uh, uh, growing. But he, one of his specialties I know of is uh, um, uh, cacti. Mm. Have you? Uh, do you have any experience uh, with? Uh, and I've, I've, I did peyote. I think once when I was about twenty. So you know, let's let's be um, bring it all right. There's like over eighteen. I think the number is eighteen. You know, mescaline containing cacti out there, right? And and the peyote cacti is the most well known because it's been uh, used in you know indigenous uh, um, native ceremonies for the past few hundred years. Uh -huh. um, so that's the most well-known one. It's also um, in a lot of greater context from a political standpoint, the most controversial one. Uh, we have um, some native groups that are really interested in like preserving uh, the cultural and ceremonial um, use of peyote and not allowing uh, consumption of the outside that space. Oh, I didn't um, know that. Yeah, um, well, Let's just let's just be a hundred percent, you know, like with it too. Is like their peyote. Um, the big the big thing about peyote from uh, a standpoint here in North America and Central America is the preservation of it naturally, right? That's the big conversation in my mind as a cultivator, as somebody that loves all entheogenic fungi, plants, and and medicines. Um, you know, preser preserving peyote is the most important thing in the grander context. However. What we do have is we have a um, we have um, an epigenetic you know level of trauma that needs to be acknowledged, revolving around the way that native people here in America were treated you know hundreds of years ago, and then the way that they were taken away from their lands and, and all the reparations and all the ideas that revolve around that. Right, mm -hmm. that's what a lot of these discussions are about because I don't think the Native American Church, which is the bigger um, the bigger organization that wants to preserve this right. Is necessarily saying that they, they don't want Westerners to consume peyote. I think it's more about making sure that the preservation of their ceremonies, their heritage, and the way of who consumes based on the way that it's naturally collected is is the is the topic. Mm -hmm. And so, by creating space to allow the Native American Church and 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 our Native peoples to hold space and and, and maintain the right to that sacred land, I think is is the simple the simple conversation. However, as a cultivator, what I would like to see is I would like to see the prolifer proliferation of peyote where everybody can grow it. And then, you know, if you're patient and you have that level of intention, then in three to five years, you'll have peyote for yourself, for your own ceremony. Is and there like a, is there like a scale that would say out of all of the psychedelics, this is uh, the, the one that would, you, you know, if you had something, you, I, you go, go right to medicine level A as opposed to. Uh, I think all of, uh, that's the that's kind of the fun part about antigens and period. It's like you know every single one is a different level, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and you know like my experience with all of them has really just taught me that they all have these different personalities, these different discussions, these different like lessons to teach. And when you kind of come back to it, whether or not it was an intense experience or it was a mellow experience. Or, you know, like you, you know, depending on your group ceremony or your personal space, like all these things affect that overall kind of understanding of what the teachings are to be laid. So, you know, if I'm going to just put them in line with each other as a simple starting point, you know, like ayahuasca is kind of the big connector, the big connector, you know, like peyote is kind of like the grounder. And like when you get in between those, you have Wachima, you have 5-MeO-DMT. You know, and 5-MeO-DMT and DMT in general are very short-lived experiences, but they're very profound. They're very, like, you know, they're repeatable. And that's the reason that it has such a it has such a, a larger context and space when we talk about consuming antigens. You still have to process DMT, right? Mm -hmm. You have to make it consumable, whether it's through inhalation or consumption, so that it breaks the blood-brain barrier. And I've heard... when you I'm do sorry. that, it's... Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> No, I was going to say, is it because I've heard specifically like certain things for certain things, right? So ayahuasca. Yeah, I mean, for... that's that's the ceremonial work. Okay, yeah. The... So the, the ayahuasca for like people that had alcohol problems is is like a very common uh, 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 link of people that are making the journey because they, they've been, you know, chronic alcoholics for 25 years and they go down and they have this. Do you, can you see it? You know, I, I can almost see in a few years us having like a regular 
MD doctor and also having a mushroom doctor or a mushroom. Yes. yes. Yeah. I, I would like to be very quick and transparent with that. Yes. I agree with that. I think the way to get to access is to create space for all the different practices that exist mm -hmm. and creating the safety networks for those practitioners. So if you're a ceremonial practitioner, here's the safety protocols that are required. If you're a doctor, like that's why doctors get so much efficacy in this conversation is because they've all taken that Hippocratic oath. And it's sort of kind of like, uh -huh. that doesn't mean doctors aren't being bad. I mean, we like just listen to podcasts out there. There's plenty of bad doctors. <laughs> but when we come to the discussion of the, the dispensation, of psychedelics or entheogens right now, the doctors kind of have the upper hand because of the way that cannabis was initially administered as well. Sure. So it's like, do we, how do we create the framework for everyone? Yeah, like you get Pfizer to buy up all of the uh, uh, mushroom processing plants in the world and have them start processing it. And as soon as they are networked through their network of paid doctors that they have everywhere, they can. They just want to patent it. Now. All, the, all the big <laughs> pharma do. wants to create the patent on the compound so that they can distribute the. And then, and then that's the hard part because what they with in in Western culture and the way that capitalization works, what they would want to do is create scarcity within the, the more kind of natural forms and, and access points. So what we need to do is we need to create regulatory framework. We need to create inclusive conversations that allow, you know, pharma to exist, but not like cut out like people like myself. Like I, I don't want to be a giant cultivator, but I certainly want to cultivate mushrooms and be able to give them away to my community as a part of my educational framework. Sure. You know, so people have access when they come into the class and they feel the value of the time that they spend here learning whatever type of things revolving around mushrooms and um, and plant medicines that they want. It's fascinating. You know, everyone around the world are all dancing around the rules. You know, uh, uh, Venus in uh, the Netherlands is got uh, water right now where they're using mm -hmm. nanotechnology in order to to put in just the right amount of uh, correct amounts of hemp derived, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, brilliant, right? <laughs> I, I continue to be amazed at by the innovation, right? So that's the, that's the hard thing to, to sit back and, and not acknowledge, right? The innovative kind of methodologies that people are creating right now as a, as a cottage industry, as in a, a, like a nascent industry, you know, an industry that doesn't really exist, but people know is about to come. Um, like I, I can't do anything other than geek out on it because people are doing really good work and, and trying to create a, a safe um, space that creates access is kind of the biggest part of the discussion that I think I'm going to continue to advocate for here in San Francisco and nationally so that, um, so that, you know, people have access and people can decide the way that they want to consume. And is that what part of what this meeting you have on Tuesday is, right? Yeah, that's exactly what we're doing is uh, we're bringing the, um, the decriminalized nature platform for uh, decriminalization of entheogenic plants and fungi to my board of supervisors. We've, we've taken um, some of the, uh, feedback and some of the direction from the greater national movement. And we're going to, um, uh, I'm kind of like, let me be uh, transparent right now. I'm antsy because they released the agenda on Friday and they haven't put it in yet. I mean, they're going to put it on Monday. I don't know. I'm kind of like, I got emails to send uh, to make sure. But I know that um, the team uh, that I've been working with for the past three years is we're all going to come to the board supervisors meeting and, and make sure that our voices are heard. And so my board supervisor said he's going to bring it. So Dean Preston, I'm praying upon you to, to pull through and do the things that you said. And what, do, what kind of outcome are you hoping to happen from this? Well, my hope is that um, between now, so the, the hardest part about this uh, for us in the city is that um, the board supervisors are going to go on their, re their summer recess, which is for a few weeks uh, until early September, late August, early September. So the hope is, is that they will bring the legislation to the board. The board will then have an opportunity to engage with us and other local constituents revolving around the topic. And then in early September, right around the time frame uh, that the state uh, assembly is going to be bringing it back to their um, uh, greater uh, 
legislature mm -hmm. uh, will have decided what the criminalization means for San Francisco. Hmm. Can we send them off with little summer vacation packages with some chocolate covered mushrooms? <laughs> Oh man, I wish, Leary had it right. I wish Leary had it right when he said dose the water. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, you know, and, and let me acknowledge all the amazing like outlaws and, and, you know, grandfathers, grandmothers, and all the amazing people that came from this area where I'm sitting right here, where my little, my little lighthouse amongst the, uh, amongst the fog sits trying to kind of progress these things because Without that um, that counterculture attitude, without the original like um, medical and research that was done into these things, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be able to like actually be at this point right now where like we're engaging the legislative conversation, right? And that's awesome. So, like, thank you for your work, my friend, and just being a part of this amazing process yourself. So, I love connecting with my my can of brothers <laughs> oh yeah well you know and, and and it was it's very obvious i mean because when we first connected it's like you have this 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 drive which is is obviously going to uh prevent you from stopping until you get what you want and so uh uh you know i see that i respect that i love your your videos your instagram videos are outstanding and i learned Thanks. so much from you and, uh, you know, it's also the, the fact that you're, you're like the next, you're the new breed of an incredible amount of history. You know, that street is the, one of the birth, birthplaces, right? Um, yeah. I'm, hey, let's, I, I get to talk to really cool people. Like I've, I've connected with amazing you know elders of this space that are come from all those different levels just because you know hate street is in the name of my business and mm -hmm. so i want to acknowledge the blessings that have been you know brought to me in my life uh to allow me to sit here and have created this space because without the intention of of having conversations and meeting amazing people like yourself and being able to connect and create what i like to call the hyphae that connects the mycelial consciousness that we're all kind of, you know, together with, uh, uh, I wouldn't be as lucky enough to sit here. So I'm, I'm, I'm nothing but blessed brother. <laughs> so let me, let me, let me, let me ask you about your crystal ball. I I've been ever telling everybody or magic wand. You've got a magic wand. Okay. You can, you can change the rules and, yep. uh, uh, create uh, what you think is fair. How sure. would you, how would you set everything up right now? I think, okay. I You're think that, I think the simplest um, point to access is creating um, a system for inclusion that, that takes into account people that are working academically to do research, people that privately want to do research, and people that are interested in standardization. So that is a point of like one kind of like what I like to call the medical model and how people engage within each of those three simple buckets, okay? Because it goes even deeper than that, what type of research and all these things people want to do and what they're going to do with their data and things like that. Because in the end, if we're not looking at what the intention of any company, organization, nonprofit mm. is, what their purpose is, and, and then applying what a licensure structure is to that particular group, because if you are a nonprofit and your whole point is to give away medicine, then you shouldn't be paying a ton of money to like, operate and be available. However, if you're a multi-million dollar corporation that wants to, you know, work on standardization and create, you know, like standardized products and things like that, then the way that you operate within the locale that you want to put your space in should also be accounted for. And that type of revenue and cost and equity structure sharing based on the agreement should be in place as well. Right. So it's like you create these different levels of engagement based on the community groups that want to. Because in the end, it's not one person like me selling mushroom chocolates out to the world, right? What it is, is it's a person like me working with a doctor, working with a ceremonial community, working to create the framework for safe recreational access. Right. So yeah. when that coalition comes together and everybody has the equity train in the way that value is exchanged, because here's the hardest part about all this, dude. It's the same thing as cannabis 20 years ago. There's no way to take money for this right now, right? And so what we need to do is invest in the systems around how we create the value chain so that 
you know, a dollar microdoses exist and your $2,500 magical experience with all this integration and super like plush experience exists too. Yeah. That's, I love that's it. what it needs to be. That's what I want the future of this to be. And I want it to be like that for every city that wants to do it the way they want to do it. And so it's like, it's hard because when I watch places like Oklahoma right now, which are like, they brought legislation to the state and then all of a sudden they're like, nope, we're only doing psilocybin research for veterans only, which is, which is fine, but they made it very clear what their model is. You're going to come and you're going to be a big corporation. You're going to apply for a license. You're going to do a study and you're only going to work with this group. You know, that's one of the things that kind of bothers me also in, in being American is the fact that, you know, Canada is getting a huge head start on all of this research. And uh, I mean, well, our neighbors to the Great White North have always had a much more progressive aspect to you know community health. Let's yeah. just acknowledge their healthcare system is a little bit better. But I want magic mushroom peanut brittle, and they've already got magic mushroom peanut brittle, and that sucks. Of course they do. Fuck, dude. <laughs> my friend, my friend is teasing me with it. He's going peanut brittle now, and I'll be having some chocolates a little bit later. And he, oh my they, gosh! Oh, they've got everything going on up there and it's all properly micro dosed yeah. and that's yeah. you know also you know speaking of that just as another kind of a, a follow-up of how i can see this going uh las vegas just got through having this interview with uh larry scheffler from planet 13 and mm. uh they are opening up a restaurant where you will be able to infuse yourself so it's a, a if you get steak with a Bernays sauce, you can get a Bernays sauce with ten percent. Uh, oh wow! Yeah, I'm excited Tacos, for that. Are we gonna meet there? Are you gonna uh, meet me there? Absolutely, oh, cool. I'm ready to I'm go. Steak that. With, oh. that sounds amazing. Tacos with guacamole. <laughs> Says your guacamole will be infused. You can. Oh, you, that's you do it I've never even thought about cannabis infused guacamole with that fat. That's a freaking amazing idea. God. <laughs> So just like my brain, because now they're going to have cannabis <laughs> lounges there, right? And I was speaking to this man two years ago about cannabis lounges, and he was telling me he already had the plan, already knew it, and he does. He's it's going to have a bar and a gaming room are you, are area you over. Me, if I think psychedelic lounges are going to exist. Oh yes, you know. And now <laughs> here's the next thing I was going to talk about is Oculus Rift. So I, I okay. created a virtual world inside uh, the Oculus Rift uh, yes, called the Hooniverse. Uh, I have a mushroom room and uh, I have a, 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 a lounge and that overlooks the Amsterdam canals and an art gallery and a, a newsroom. Anything that your mind can imagine, you can create in there. And I have been to two or three different rave parties and a mushroom party that was all a psychedelic 360 degrees. One of them was the size of if you were walking into an airplane hangar. I mean, wow. as far as the distance, the In scale, the metaverse, huh? And you had to go over and walk this long distance to get there. <laughs> and then you get in there and every, it was the most amazing. And if you look at some of the early videos that I did, I have a couple mm -hmm. of other I've worlds. Seen them, man. I've, I've seen what you've built. It's pretty Ooh, cool. The, well, it's it's the also some of the worlds that are in there. Like there's a mm -hmm. mushroom world that I did on one of my episodes. It might be with Ian's episode. Ian, oh, cool. You know Ian, right? Do you, I do know Ian. Yeah. Okay. Ian's one of my local collaborators and a good friend of mine. Um, oh yeah. yeah. He was wonderful. He's, he is dude, he is by far one of the top scientists in this in this emerging space. Mm -hmm. And I've been, I'm very blessed to know him and his crew over in Oakland and the amazing work that they've been progressively doing for the past three plus years, advocacy work, the access, just, just really, really great guys overall. I was blown away by the process and how they went about it. And, you know, I, I was going, well, how do you test multiple doses of different kinds of mushrooms without, is there one person? And, and he's like, he's Mikey, he's like, Mikey, <laughs> it's like, let him try him. Okay, let's go. Yeah, he, he uh, you know, this is the best part about this is when you look at the overall community that's here in the Bay Area, when you're looking at even the original like grandfathers and fathers of this, you know, like Jim Fadiman, Stanley Krippner, Dr. David E. Smith, like the founder of the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic, all these older gentlemen that were like back in their day were just open-minded enough to think whether it was harm integration 
or like dispensation or, or studies or things like that. They created the found the foundation for us to be able to have conversations like we're having right now. So we have to acknowledge them, but we also have to move forward to the more important conversations revolving around the amazing diverse communities that exist in spaces like San Francisco, like Oakland, like Santa Cruz, like Ann Arbor, like um, Washington, D.C., and all these places across the country and globe that are like bringing these conversations to the table. Can you see a point in the future where San Francisco and and in particular the Haight area will go back to its initial glory as being, you know, the the spot to go to around the world? There'll be 50 shops all up and down the street where you could get all kinds of different- right. You know, the first psychedelic shop was right up on Haight Street. And there's a there's a pizza, an amazing pizza joint there right now. Um, and, you know, that was very short lived, right? It was from basically 1965 to 1967 uh, before it kind of got shut down. Yeah. And you could go in there and, and basically purchase LSD. Mm -hmm. Now, where do we sit now? Because, like, even cannabis, like, cannabis uh, coming to the Haight Ashbury has been something that was, like, actually withheld by the city for a very long time. And now we have two of the largest cannabis companies in the world, like, having their biggest retail spots right here in my neighborhood in a very short like small green zone that exists towards the end of of hate street near golden gate park which two? so what's that what which two? Oh, it's um cookies so cookies. burners on hate yeah. yeah. and um harborside opened up their new dispensary harborside. around the corner on stanion street mm -hmm. so we have um the the block that exists for the air quote green zone and the hate is a very very small um, like one square block and wow. both of the, the dispensaries, which are multi-million dollar corporations in the cannabis space exist here. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, what do I think as the hate street shroom it's shop wrong, as a guy that someday wants that? Well, let me tell you, you know, like I want to see dispensation here, but I also want to make sure that there's like a moratorium or at least some sort of like discussion point or regulatory framework for people that own a cannabis license or are invested in the cannabis industry here in the city to not be able to necessarily have the first grab at licenses, because to me, that's a monopoly. And, you know, nobody can compete with multi-million dollar corporations like Steve D'Angelo and like Burners, you sure. know, and, and Cookies. So, Or what you know, about, this, look what you had up in Canada, you know, yeah, Jody yeah. Emery's uh, 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 Twitter feed where she's got the, all the, the police people and all the politicians who were the ones who all- And, and let me let me be honest too, like a lot of my local small business owner friends that are up on Haight Street, right? Like I'm actually a couple blocks off of Haight Street. It's the big joke that I always tell people. It's like, if you're not willing to find the Haight Street shroom shop, then you haven't searched hard enough because yeah. I'm actually on Hayes Street. I'm yeah. about across the panhandle, not very far from Cole and Haight Street. Yeah. But, you know, my, my friends that are up there that have businesses that are, you know, thriving and, and working on the neighborhood aspects of why the Hit ashbury is so important to the history of this city and to the history of like psychedelics and cannabis and things like that, you know, they all support this. They all support the movement of this and they want to see like microdoses be available in like different like, you know, formats and things like that. And whether or not the microdoses are like, you know, point like, Two five to 0.5 grams, which is going to threshold somebody and make them feel it, or it's all the way down at 0.1 and we're like playing Dr. Jim Fadiman's, you know, like 10% of a psychedelic experience, like number for microdosing. I think there's going to be a point in time where you're going to be able to just like Delta 8 or other THC, you know, byproducts and variants. You're going to be able to go into the corner store and get microdoses of psilocybin or microdoses of psilocybin derivative products. Have you had any experience with THCO or THCP? Um, not O. Um, I've had a little bit of B and then I've mainly kind of messed around with Delta A because that was the thing that somebody kind of like provided to me one time to try out. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'm I'm a very straightforward kind of like sun grown California cannabis guy. Like I try my best because I like to consume my cannabis. And um, when I do when I do smoke it, like I like to have sun grown. I tend to find that the dispensary cannabis now is, I, mean, I don't know if I'm getting too old or something. Yeah. <laughs> That's a little too strong for me. Yeah. I can, I can, I can hang. Don't get me wrong. I love it. But, uh, you know, I prefer, I prefer a mellow, a mellow, a mellow blend. And uh, I tend to notice that the sun grown California stuff that's organically grown tends to be the, the, the good OG to me. That's, yeah. that's what I like. You know, it's, uh, I'm excited. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have an opportunity to uh, interview <laughs> Ben Dronkers. Uh, the guy Ooh. from uh, Sensi Seeds and, uh, you know, one of the real legends uh, in, in the Netherlands. 
And uh, it's interesting because he made his, one of the main bis business decisions he made was not to really be a coffee shop, but to do seeds because he didn't want to go to jail. And, you know, he waited and, you know, it's much like what you are. It's obviously you, uh, and plus you have the most beautiful new puppy. So, you know, you can't go to jail. <laughs> she's, she's dead asleep right now still oh, <laughs> i'm very blessed i have a mellow little micro mutt as i say i'm gonna i'm actually gonna try my best to train her she's a, a golden retriever um aussie shepherd and i'm gonna try and train her to hunt mushrooms with me mm. and uh, help me find some of the wild ones that i like you know to give her a working job <laughs> that's fantastic give myself more of a job Dude, I can sit and talk to you for about three or four hours, and um, I I haven't even started talking about um, uh, some of your your tips and thoughts about growing, um, and about in, and for the people that are able to to grow properly. Um, I did want to warn you though, or not warn you, but uh, I want I want to tell you that I do have some high expectations for you because one of the <laughs> things we do with each one of our guests on the show is we create a a Spotify music playlist. Oh, and, a playlist. Oh, yes. I can make that happen. Okay. That sounds like fun. How many songs do I have to do? <laughs> Whatever, what, you know, it's a wake and bake, uh, wake and bake format, it's songs that are important to you or things okay. that people will think about you when they hear that song. All and, right. I'm down. Just, that sounds yeah. like fun, man. Fantastic. Oh, sweet. Dude, um, again, uh, thrilled that you were able to come in. Good luck on <laughs> Tuesday. Kick some major ass. Yeah, um, man. And then uh, let's come back on again afterwards and, and we can Oh, I, I can't wait. I can't wait to jam with you again, man. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for bringing all these amazing people together and having conversations and trying to enlighten the world. And uh, I can't wait to figure out how to be in your, you know, in your fourth dimensional world inside oh. the Hooter space, man, in the Hooterverse. <laughs> we'll get, we got to get an Oculus over there. That's it. You oh, just got to get an Oculus or, you know. I got to get, I got to get my glasses off and not be so tired from being sleep deprived without a puppy. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Oh, man. Hey, thank you again, brother. And uh, have respect. a wonderful day. Excellent. We'll see you soon. Welcome back, everyone. Wasn't that a great interview? What did I tell you? Dude knows his shrooms. I can't wait to talk to him again. I think we're just getting started on this subject. Anyway, listen, I am going to continue my little, uh, my little journey here in this amazing world. And I will see you guys on Saturday with a brand new Wake and Bake with Captain Hooter. See you guys later. <laughs> it's Captain Hooter, far out, man.